I have a belief that the real books are not the books that people know about. For some reason, either they're not taught or they're not translated or they're not translated well enough. And so people are living in the absence of the food they need, the literary food that you would need in order to feel life. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf today. I am so excited to talk about Bookworm, Conversations with Michael Silverblatt, out today from The Song Cave. I have had the supreme pleasure of having a small part in reading over and proofing the manuscripts in so many different iterations for this book for over a year now and just savoring it as a longtime bookworm listener and fan. Even before I met Michael Silverblatt in 2021, there in his home in Los Angeles, I, like many of you, used to tune in every Thursday and just lap up these literary conversations. He is definitely not only a bookworm, but the bookworm. And this project brings out for the very first time transcripts of some of his best episodes. We've got the conversations with John Ashbery, John Berger, Octavia Butler, Joan Didion, Carlos Fuentes, William H. Gass, Tony Morrison, Grace Paley, V. Guy Sebald, Stephen Sondheim, Susan Sontag, and David Foster Wallace. And yes, that very first conversation with David Foster Wallace about his book Infinite Jest, where David Foster Wallace responds at one point to Michael with, I think I want to ask you to adopt me, is collected in this book. That has been sort of the quote heard around the world in bookworm terms. It should be noted that one of the criteria used in selecting the transcripts to include in this book was that the author had to be dead. It was really the only way to try and keep things fair with so many incredible conversations to choose from and with so many great writers still living and breathing among us today. Shameless plug for myself, I'm very proud to appear in the acknowledgments. Thank you so much to poet, editor, and friend Alan Felsenthal, who says extra special thanks to Chris Via for his attention and insight. Thank you, Alan. In addition to this video, I have also written a full-length book review of this book, and it is available right now on the Los Angeles Review of Books website. The link to my review is in the description. I also want to take this opportunity to give away two copies of the book, two shrink-wrapped, unopened, untampered with, fresh, beautiful, pristine copies. So if you want to enter the drawing for one of the copies, enter a comment below. It can be about anything. And then in about a week or so, I will go and reply to your comment, letting you know that you won. And so expect to you know, be checking that and get back with me and we'll arrange shipping details. I won't talk too much about the contents of the book since I do have that full length review on LARB, but I do want to point out that on the very first page, the very opening paragraph of the very first talk with John Ashbery about his A Worldly Country, Michael Silverblatt calls John Ashbery a connoisseur of wonderlands. And this is just a hint at everything that is to come. As a lot of us know, Michael Silverblatt was as much a poet and writer himself as the writers with whom he would have a conversation. Even though he hasn't written any original work, and we hardly have anything from him in print, though there is some, Michael Silverblatt made his name in radio, and indeed, he is a wonderful conversationalist. But he constantly comes up with these beautiful phrases and beautiful epithets, such as Ashbery being a connoisseur of Wonderlands. In conversation with John Berger, at one point, Michael says, 
I think that fiction is one of the places where we go for silence. A worded silence. I love that. Words that amount to or return to silence. And the best fiction maybe even aspires to a kind of muteness. In one of the conversations with the great William Gass, Michael says, The job of the writer is to take the dying world and not lie about the fact that it is a dying world, but bring it to life in a constantly animating prose. Again with Gass, Michael says, The relationship between sentences within a paragraph, between that paragraph and its ideas, those ideas and the world, that world and the world of the story, the story and what it means, beyond what it's about. The relationship among these things is what fiction is about. To talk about that relationship is to talk about fiction more clearly, more precisely, more meaningfully than to talk about morals and symbols and themes. Suffice it to say that, like many of you, I'm sure, I, as a reader, have learned an incredible wealth of knowledge about reading and about appreciating, respecting, deepening my relationship with literature from Michael Silverblatt. In 2018, Michael Silverblatt was awarded the inaugural Deborah Pease Prize from a public space in recognition of his advancement of literature. And he was acknowledged as reinventing the art of literary conversation. But as part of that, this little booklet was put together and given out to the people who attended that ceremony. And I just happened to be lucky enough, blessed enough to have received a copy of it. This booklet contains a ton of appreciative remarks about Michael Silverblatt from different writers who had been on the program Bookworm over its past few decades. In the opening remarks, Alan Felsenthal says, It's hard to resist someone who has read all of your work in print, and even out of print, and can tell you what you didn't know you didn't know about yourself. He agreed to do the show Bookworm initially, and he actually did it without pay for years. Robbie Alamadeen said, he not only asked questions that forced me to rethink aspects of my novels, but a couple of times he explained my work to me. And unlike mansplaining, Mike-splaining was most welcome. Michael Silverblatt is a national treasure. I love that, Mike-splaining. Isabel Allende said, His knowledge could be intimidating without his kindness. In his presence, I feel cherished. Charmaine Craig said, his line of questioning led me to dangerous cliffs from which it was impossible to retreat to answers I developed while promoting my book. But he never stranded me at the cliff. Together, we took plunges and discovered connections and interpretations that I think neither of us had previously arrived at, or could have arrived at, were his process not so co-creative. Steve Erickson simply called Michael Silverblatt the Reader Laureate. Of America. Alexander Maxick said, what a joy, I thought, to be in the company of someone for whom an hour isn't enough time to talk about a novel. What a relief that there are still minds like his humming along, demanding that writing matters. Carol Muskie Dukes said, if, as his theme song asserts, we are all books, then Michael Silverblatt is not just one book. He is a living library. The books within him speak volumes, literally. All you have to do is listen, then to catch up. Read, read, read. Gary Steingart says, Michael Silverblatt is an extraterrestrial refugee from a civilization far more advanced than our own, in which the humanities are worshipped, dissected, and made whole again. He's also very, very funny. And Mona Simpson says, a reader as imaginative as a writer Michael Silverblatt reminds us of what a book is. Not a gift, but a collaboration. Something a reader makes, too. He understands what the industry's professional readers do not. Skimming books to mind plots that can be made into something else. That true reading, which is rereading, demands an investigation into a reader's own values and moral inventory. 
through an improbable contradiction, thousands of people listening to Bookworm alone in their cars create a community. Like I said, we don't have much actually in print from Michael Silverblatt, but every now and then I'll come across a nice little surprise, such as reading Tolstoy together by Yi Yun Li. On the very first page, we get this Michael Silverblatt quote set off on its own page. That is its greatest beauty. In some mysterious way, the reader collaborates with the text to bring it to life. The art of writing depends on the art of reading. He also contributed an introduction to the stories of Kenward Elmsley out from the Song Cave. There's a blurb on the back of this book that I reviewed as part of my Los Angeles series, La Medusa by Vanessa Place. And of course, his very terse but very notable blurb on the front cover of William H. Gass's The Tunnel, where Michael says, the most beautiful, most complex, most disturbing novel to be published in my lifetime. And he revered The Tunnel and even has an original manuscript that Gass gave him. Michael and his famous library pop up in this book, Biblio style. Here you can see some gorgeous pictures of his library. You might recognize it from the video that I did back in 2021 after I visited him in Los Angeles where I do a quick and unsteady tour of this library, but it has its own apartment. He has two apartments there side by side, one for living and one for his books. In this brief section on his library, it's fun to point out that he recommends Donald Barthelme's sadness to sensitive readers. And he also offers the short story anthology from Randall Jarrell to all readers as a book he hopes that all readers read. I'll never forget that winter day in December of 2020 when I sent this email to Michael Silverblatt trying to ask him for permission to use something from one of the Bookworm episodes. And I labored over that email for hours and hours to get everything just right and to make sure that I somehow caught his attention. And I'll never forget that he replied with a very brief, Chris, give me your phone number and I'll call you after I'm done taping an episode. And I mean, it was like electric waves went through my body. I couldn't believe, first of all, that I was communicating with him, presumably, and not, you know, an assistant or something at KCRW, but that he actually did call me. And we had our first conversation very briefly and agreed to call back and, and talk later. And then we talked for over four hours that first night. Over time, we emailed more and more. We spoke on the phone more and more. And then roughly a year later, I actually visited him and spent time eating brunch together, looking through his library, talking. And then I came home and put together the little video of my quick tour of his library. And as it would happen, just a couple of days after I was there in his apartment visiting with him and had met his precious cat of 22 years, Tati, the cat passed away shortly after I departed from Los Angeles. And he found so much healing from that grief in not just the video that I put together, but all of the beautiful, warm, kind, appreciative, loving comments that all of you started to offer. He was reading through those and it honestly touched his heart. As you would expect with such a sensitive reader, he is a very emotionally sensitive person, a very deeply compassionate person. But that feedback, which he had never really encountered from his show over so many decades, it not having a comment section, it was just very moving to him and very, very helpful on the heels of the loss of his companion of 22 years. But on a brighter note, at one point, I inquired about his reading habits, which I had been doing off and on, but he sent me an email with his sort of foolish treatment, and I thought I'd share it with you all. He would often go to sleep early and arrange to awaken in the middle of the night. He said that he could read more quickly between the hours of about 2.30 and 7 a.m. He said that he would fall asleep often and dream that he was still reading the book. And then he would wake up and have to go back about 20 pages or so and sort of unravel that intertwining of the reality of reading and the dreamscape of reading. 
he would make a point, of course, to reread a book, especially books he was going to talk about on the Bookworm show. And like many other rereaders, he found that reading the book for the first time was just barely an introduction to it. He chose to live alone so that he would not disturb people with his strange reading habits. He said his reading speed, of course, varies according to the book at hand or the time of day. He referred to his reading speed as a dawdler's pace of about 10 pages per hour. And he noted that he lets each book tell him how it needs to be read. So like I said, and as many of you know, Michael is one of, if not our greatest reader out there. He has been a guiding light for me, yes, and for so many others. And so this is a monumental publishing event to have these transcripts collected for the very first time. You do not want to miss getting your hands on a copy of Bookworm, whether you win one of the two copies I'm giving away or rush to the Song Cave and purchase it right now. We'll let a moment from one of the conversations with Susan Sontag wrap this up for us. She says, every day of my life, I try not to think about whether literature, literature of the highest aspiration and the highest seriousness, still has an audience. I know it does. You and I are not alone, Michael, and there are a number of people listening to this program that I'm sure are sensitive readers who do or would care about the kind of books we're talking about. Yes, Susan. Yes, Michael. We, that audience, are here and we are listening and reading.